Look, look at your neighbor and say, excuse me. This week I had the privilege of uh, going to North Carolina and flew there and um, on my flight there, everything was good. It was half empty plane and you know what that means for guys like us, my size, I, I get to have an empty seat beside me. I fly southwest. A means, A, you get on first. B means you get a better seat. C means you get the center seat. That's how they board. And thankfully, I was in the, uh, the, the A category, so I got a good seat. But on the way there, everything was half full and didn't have to sit by anybody. This empty space beside me in the middle seat. I thought, thank you, Jesus. And... Uh, on the way from North Carolina back, from Charlotte back to, I flew to, to Chicago, Midway, and um, pleasant folks in Chicago. And, uh, and that flight was half full, uh, or close to it, maybe it had some empty seats. Anyway, I had an empty seat beside me, I didn't care if it was half full, three quarters full, I knew just nobody was sitting beside me. Thank you, Jesus. And then I had a flight from Chicago to Columbus, and it's about a 45 minute flight. And I was sitting there, and it was, I was looking, and they're looking at all the last people to board, and I thought, man, this is, what's the chances? Four for four. Nobody sitting beside me. This is going to be great. And here comes a dude. And he is, he's a good-sized guy. Me and him together, it looked about like the size of him. He was a big, big dude. And the stewardess said something, sir, can you please find a seat so we can take off? And he looked over at me, and I looked at him, and we caught eyes with each other. And he did not read what I was putting out. Because my eyes said, please find another seat. Not beside me. And he goes, is that seat taken? And I said, yeah. My imaginary friend's sitting there. And he comes in, he sits in. He's got big, broad shoulders. I mean, he's just a big dude. I mean, I know, I know John's a, a good-sized guy. He was a, he was a little, little shorter than John, but he was, he was much wider. And he sits down, and we get close. And I, don't, I always take the window seat, and I remember why I should never take the window seat. Because when he's doing this, that wall don't move, y'all. So I'm like this on my phone all the way from Chicago to Columbus. And while I was worried about that during that part of the trip, it was the trip prior to that from Charlotte to Midway to Chicago that I believe the Lord gave me something special for this morning. You say, hold on a second. You were on a plane and God spoke to you. Listen. You can understand and we can understand God can speak wherever he wants. We just have a trouble listening many times. Amen. Uh, and, and so I want to share a message with you. And I believe it's going to be a blessing to your life. We're going to look at a few scriptures, just one scripture specifically to start. John chapter 8, verse 42 through 44. John chapter 8, verses 42, 44 of chapter 8. It says this, Jesus said unto them, this is the NIV, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I have come here from God, I have not come here on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you're unstable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is the father, or he is a liar and the father of all lies. You say, Pastor, that just got really weird. You going to be talking about that? Yep, that's what we're talking about today. Look at your neighbor say, excuse me. Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, there have been struggles and tests this morning from wake up 
even to now, and I believe those struggles have been on purpose. I believe those tests have been on purpose because I think you want to do a work in this house. I believe you want to do a work in this people. Lord, I pray, God, that you would move through your spirit today. We come against every hindrance and every distraction. We say, this is your house. Move as only you can move. Touch as only you can touch. And we're going to thank you for it and give you praise. And everybody said, amen. Amen. So as I was, as I was uh, on the plane, I was having a conversation with God. I was having a conversation around some things that I'm believing God is going to do in my life, in my family, in this church, in our community. You say a conversation, were you praying? Listen, prayer is a conversation. That's Now it wasn't like I was the weird guy in the corner, that's why nobody sat by me, okay? It wasn't like I was like, what did you say? Okay, no, no, no. It's having a quiet conversation. With God. And and maybe you've never been to the place where I got, though. And I'm thankful for the word. How many appreciated the word last week Pastor Brozier pr- brought to us? Amen. That was a, a great word. Have faith in God. Amen. It was a, a great word. If you didn't catch it, catch it on some of our social media. It's available. But as good as the message was last week, something started to creep up inside when I started talking about and praying about and having a conversation with God about the things that I believe he was going to do in my life and the things that he's going to do in my family and the things he's going to do in our church and the things he's going to do in community. A little thing crept up, and maybe you've never faced this before, but a little word called doubt. And as as the doubt began to creep up, I believe the the, the Lord shared two words with me that I need to share with you this morning. And it's not excuse me. We'll get there in a minute. But as I began to to, to pray, and and, and, and all of a sudden the, the, the things started going in my mind, well, I would love to see God do this in our situation. And then that doubt was there. Two words, are you ready for them? He said, why not? He said, why not? And I want to ask you this morning when you hear the question, why can't I be all God's called me to be? God's saying, why not? Why can't my friends and family be saved? God's saying, why not? Hold on just a second this morning. I need you to help me today. I'm going to walk in health. Why not? I want to see cancer destroyed. Why not? I I want to see miracle signs and wonders. Why not? I I want to see revival in my family. Why not? Look at your neighbor and say, why not? Why not grow? Why not build? Why not be? I want to tell you this morning, your pedigree does not prevent you from things that God wants to do in your life. You may have come from a jacked up family. God still wants to use you. You may have come from a silver spoon situation. God still wants to use you. Your pedigree doesn't prevent you from God being used in your life. And nor does your past disqualify you from what God wants to do in your life. Why not? God, when he spoke... To Moses from the burning bush did not say I am not but when he spoke to Moses he said I am that I am this morning you may be thinking I can't but I'm telling you there's an I am that's on the inside of you you may be saying I'm not sure I can do that God's saying, why not? Because there's something on the inside of you that is bigger than you. Why not? Somebody say, why not? Why not grow? And I'm not talking about eating donuts. Although they're not bad for you if they're the strawberry kind or the apple fritter. Because those are fruit in there. 
Why, why not grow? Grow yourself. Grow in your walk with Jesus. Grow in your grow in grace. Why not grow? Why not build? You say, well, pastor, what do you want me to do? Go get some Legos and build something? No, I'm talking about building up others. Building up the kingdom. Building up connections. Building up relationships. Building up a legacy of faithfulness. Uh Uh-oh. I just said a bad word. That faithfulness word. Listen. Someday... I was talking about yesterday making the paper, and everybody was talking about Pastor Brozier, and he's in the paper all the time, and he's a TV star and everything like that. And, 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 and I said, he's been, he's been around about 35 years here. Somebody said, you need to get in the paper. I said, well, I, I can't pay for an advertisement, and I've got more of a radio face. And, and y'all caught it. Good. Amen. And, and I said, I'm going to make the paper. With my picture, 35 years, it might be an obituary. (laughs) But here's the thing. I want my grandkids to know. I want my kids to realize. I want people around to know. He may not have been perfect. His hair wasn't always right. But he was faithful. He was faithful to the call that God had on his life. He was faithful to the work that God called him to do. He was a faithful follower of Jesus. You say, well, pastor, I don't know. I can't do everything all at one time. God's not asking you to do it. He's asking you to build a legacy of faithfulness. Why not be? Why not grow? Why not build? Why not be? Be an agent of change in our world for Jesus. Be an agitator, not an aggravator in our society. How many know what an agitator is? All right, three people. When it stops working in your washer, you will. An agitator is that thing in the washer that goes back and forth. And what it does is it rubs back and forth on the fabric very slightly and breaks down the soil and the dirt and the grime and the nastiness That's what an agitator does. An aggravator is defined as an unpleasant person who's annoying and exasperating. Look at your neighbor and say, I know the difference. I know the difference. The problem, hear me this morning. We got too many people that are worried about being an aggravator with people standing up, shouting and yelling and screaming all that they believe rather than being an agitator, which is someone that builds a relationship with people and allows the Jesus that's on the inside of them to rub a little bit. And here's what happens. Once he starts rubbing, the walls start coming down because the cleanliness that God wants to bring in their life is met by them rubbing a little bit. But we would rather... Help me not get mad today. Listen, I'm frustrated when I see believers stand up, and I believe there's a time to stand up for what's right. There's truth, there's holiness, there's righteousness, there is right. But I'm going to tell you, yelling at people's faces and holding up signs doesn't get the job done. All right, I'm going to move on because you didn't didn't like that one at all. Why not be an agitator rather than an aggravator? Why not be a thermostat rather than a thermometer? I'm going to see what the temperature of the room is, and I'm going to adjust my beliefs to that. That's the society we live in today, and that's why the church is a mess. That's why believers are going to miss heaven, because we've got churches that are dried up, dead, and lukewarm. Can I tell you, God's not coming back for a lukewarm, dead church. He is coming back for a church that is alive and full of life. A thermostat. Look at your neighbor and say, why not? Somebody say, excuse me. Why not as a church do we not grow a little bit more? I'm glad to see you today. I'm thankful that we're filling seats. I'm thankful that we are moving in relationships. I'm thankful that we are growing, but why don't we grow our families even more? One of our core values is we grow better together. I don't want it just to be a statement. I need it to be a reality. We grow better together. 
as a church, why not build? Why not build the kingdom up? Can I tell you this morning, the only thing that I have a desire to do is build the kingdom. God, I'm focused on building the kingdom. He's going to take care of building his church. I'm not worried about how many people are in the building. I'm worried about how many people we're getting into heaven. Don't get me wrong, I do love it when you come, though. Why not build connections? Yesterday we had a cornhole tournament. Jim, Jim and I, we were, we were listen, we decided to bless people yesterday. Jim and I were cornhole partners. He couldn't see the board, I couldn't hit the board. <laughs> And instead of us taking them out, Jim and I decided to be a blessing and let two teams beat us. That sound better? That sound better than them beating us. Yeah, amen. But, but I, I, I heard a young man. Where's Derek? Derek? Derek says, he says, next time we should just put everybody's name in a hat. Now, mind you, he got second place, so it wasn't like he was one of the blessed the people that, that we gave to. Um, he said, you should put everybody's name in a hat. And just draw them out. And that way you can have different partners so everybody can get to learn each other and know each other a little bit more. I was like, I've heard that kid say some crazy stuff like the Chiefs are good. And, oh, they are good. Never mind. But he was good. He was right. Why? Because he wanted to build connections. Listen, I'm ready. I, I, I know you, you look at things and, and you, you may see things right now. I'm ready to push the walls out of the building. I'm ready to, to see something different in here. Not because I want to get a bigger building, but because I'm ready to see God do what he is wanting to do through this congregation today. I, I'm ready to build. Why not? Why not? Why not be the hands and the feet of Jesus to our community why not love the unlovable, reach the unreachable, touch the untouchable, and do the undoable? Why not do it? A number of years back, I've told this story, and I'm going to be brief with it. We, we purchased um, the YWCA in, in Kokomo. Our church did. It was a rundown facility, but it was literally a million-dollar facility that we got for $85,000. It was a miracle how we got it, and it had all this thing, but it was in the worst part of town. There were drug, if you go left, there were drug houses. If you go right, there was a uh, city hall. Sometimes you wonder if they're both kind of, anyway, okay. I didn't. That was Kokomo, wasn't Salina. Because I wouldn't say that here. Um, but but, but here, 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 here's what happened. We were at a, at a funeral, and this, this pastor come up, and, and we were talking. He said, did you guys buy that building? I said, yes, sir. He said, what are you going to do with that? So we're going to turn it into a youth center, and where school's going to be moved down there. Our Christian school's going to be moved down there. It's going to be a youth center for kids to come in and hang out, and it's going to be a place for people to come in and hear the word of God. It's going to be a Bible institute, all these different things. And he said, well... If that's the kind of people you want to reach, I guess it's going to be okay for that. I looked at him, I was like, yes, sir. That is exactly the kind of people I want to reach. Why? Because that's exactly the people that Jesus is reaching today. Listen, he doesn't just reach out for those that have it all together. He, he reaches for the people that are all jacked up. He reaches for the people that haven't always got it right. Ah, yeah, that's the kind of people. Somebody say, why not? I'm not going to listen to negative Nancy and brother complains a lot who's married to sister. I don't believe God can. I'm done listening to them people. Listen, I'm serving a God and I'm looking at you saying, why not? Listen, watch what God is going to do. Look at your neighbor and say, why not? This morning, the only excuse or the only thing that we can give as to why not only thing we can give to why not is an excuse. We're going to pause and get here for a minute. The enemy is going to feed us full of excuses because he understands that if he can keep us living in a place where God can't, then we'll never be in a place where we can. The enemy of our destiny are excuses. I'm going to say that again. 
the enemy of your destiny and my destiny are excuses. I'm going to give you a few. First is the excuse of self. Oh, what? it got quiet. You was all shouting a minute ago. I've heard people say, I, I cannot do it because this happened to me when I was younger. I can't do it because... Uh, I, because I failed, God can't use me because I've messed up too many times. I'm I'm not good enough. I'm I'm not. I've been abused. I've been I've been treated poorly. I, I I've, I've I've messed up. I don't have the right words to say. I'm not I'm not smart enough. I'm I'm not intelligent enough. I'm not educated enough. I got hurt in church. Can I say this about the last thing I just said? People hurt you. Jesus didn't. People hurt you. Jesus didn't. How many's ever went to a restaurant before and had a bad experience? Hold on, hold on, hold on. If you haven't, I want to go eat with you. Some of you are like, I don't eat out, and you just raise your hand that you had a bad experience. So I'm, maybe it's home. Okay. Here's the thing. How many's had the bad experience at a restaurant before? Yeah. And when I hear people say, "I've got hurt in church. I'm never going to go back," this is what I think of. You went to a restaurant, had a bad experience. That's like saying, I'm never going to eat food again. People use self as an excuse. I got hurt in church. I'm not good enough. When someone says, why not? Your reason is because you're flawed. Your reason is you're not good enough. Your reason is I'm messed up. But who's saying that? Whose thoughts, where are those coming from? Those aren't thoughts from God. But it's what we read earlier. They're coming from the Father of all lies. And feeding you with excuses as to why you'll never be. I failed. I tried that before and I failed. I, I'm not good enough. I, I, I failed before. I, I let people down. I disappointed people. I can't do that again. He's trying to feed you with all these excuses and we start spitting them out of our mouth. You say, well, how do you know that's not true? Because the Bible says greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I have the great I am on the inside of me, so I don't have an I can't. You may feel like you're not worthy. You may feel like you're not loved. You may feel like you're not good enough. You may feel like you're not strong enough. But God didn't say that. God said you're worthy. God said you're loved. God said you're strong enough. God says you are enough. I can't do it because I, listen, if everything that I did, I know I was fully equipped for, I would not be standing here today. I didn't come from a family that read the Bible every night and had a devotion. I love my mom. She was faithful. She loved us. She took us to church. But I'm just telling you the honest truth. I didn't get into the Word every week, and I didn't know all the Bibles when I was, all the books of the Bible when I was growing up. I knew some Bible stories, but that's about it. I, I, I didn't know all that stuff. And when God called me to preach, I was like, I don't know what to do with this. I just was good teaching Sunday school with kids. I was good. I, I was good with, 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 and I say that, don't, don't, please understand. I don't mean that disrespectfully. Because listen, if you, if you think you can teach kids, go try. But I related to those, hear me, I related to those kids because I was a kid that came from a broken home. And we picked up more than half of them that came from broken families. I knew what it was like to not feel like I had any worth. And I remember, I remember thinking, God, how am I going to preach to people? I mean, nobody wants to hear me talk about things that I don't even know the books of the, books of the Bible yet, God. 
And someone said this, and I know it's nothing new. But I'm telling you today because you might feel like this. God will equip you for all he calls you for. Doesn't mean, listen, it didn't mean when I said yes, Lord, that all of a sudden I knew the books of the Bible. I had to put some effort in. I had to study. But hear me, God will equip you for everything he calls you for. Somebody say, excuse me. Not only is our self an excuse we use, but we also use the excuse of situations. Satan is manipulating situations around us to stop us from reaching the place that God has for us. The problem is many are using the excuse of the situation. As I was preparing this message, I'm going to tell you the Lord said something to me, and, it, it, and, and I don't believe I've ever said it before. If I have, I don't remember it. I don't remember ever writing it down. Maybe I did. If I did, I don't know. But I know God said this. The enemy is using the situation to bury you. But that thing ain't going to be your tomb. It's going to be a womb. He said that thing is not going to be a tomb. It's going to be a womb. You say, Pastor Steve, what are you talking about? The tomb is the place where things go to die. But the womb is where things go to live. The situation that the enemy is trying to bring into your life and that you are going through, that he meant to destroy you, can I tell you, it's not going to kill you, but it's going to produce life on the inside of you. It's not your tomb, it's going to be a womb. Say, Pastor, I'm a man. Yeah, I know he's going to do it spiritually. Say, uh, 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 oh, help me, Jesus. Say, well, I don't know about being pregnant. I want you to understand, when I moved to Salina, Ohio, I came over here pregnant. I'm not talking about the stomach size. I'm talking about something on the inside of me, that God birthed is a dream on the inside of me of what he's going to do. And I believe with everything in me, I'm living with expectation that God is going to fulfill what he has called us to do. Don't be pregnant if you want. That's your business. Some of y'all so far from relationship with God, you'll never see it in any way. Whew. I'm going to pause because, whoo, help me, Jesus. Not in my notes. Get back to your notes, Bretcher. I'm going. Quit using the situation as an excuse. The enemy is manipulating situations to prevent you from reaching the place that God has called you to be. He's manipulating situations from the purpose that God has called you for. And you're using them as an excuse. What he doesn't understand is that I am getting stronger. I'm getting more encouraged. I'm getting more committed. Because I can look back over my life. And I can see the things and the battles that I've fought and the battles that I've won. I can look back over my life and see the things that God has brought me through. I can look back over my life and see the testimony after testimony of what God's done. The devil thinks he's got me, but I've got news for you. I'm fighting stronger today than I ever have because God has brought me this far. It's still a fight. I said it's still a fight. This morning it was a fight. I woke up. I felt fine. I got a text. My wife's laying right beside me and she said, in the text. I had a list that was about that long of the things I needed to get prepared and bring to church for the dinner. But she's like, I can't. I was like. Time to get up. <laughs> I can't. It was a fight this morning. Not with her. It was a fight for me. Not because I have to do other things, but because, you know, all of a sudden the thing starts swirling. It was a fight. I'm fighting the good fight of faith. We love the scripture. I fought a good fight. I've ran my race. I finished my course. But we got to remember it's a fight. We still got to run. We still got to finish. Still got to keep the faith. Someone say, I'm still fighting. Stand there in my path. 
I'm still going to fight. Block me and try, I'm still going to fight. Trip me up, I'm still going to fight. If I'm clawing, I'm going to fight. If I got to drag my, I'm going to fight. I've seen too much to turn back now. I said I've seen too much to turn back now. Real quick, give me four, give me, give me five, four, four, four guys. Kenny, come here. Luke, come here. Uh, ben, come here. Uh, Craig, come here. Chris, come here. You stay right here. Face this way. There you go. There you go. Good. We practice all this before church today because they don't know. Ben, come here. Right here. Face that way. Craig, stand here. We are on a journey. We are on a journey. And the enemy will manipulate things to block us from the place that God has called us here. If it was easy, everybody would do it. But the Bible said it's a fight. It's a fight. But here's what the enemy doesn't understand. Here's, sorry, flip it. There we go. Here's what the enemy doesn't understand. Is that he may block me. If I go here and then I go here and and I go here and I can't get by him. But sooner or later, I'm going to spin move. Oh, yeah, look at that. I just did some agitation. Yeah, yeah, you see that? Some of y'all impressed. I did not get drafted in the NFL draft this weekend, believe it or not. As soon as I, as soon as I get this guy down, there's another one. Here's another one. And I gotta fight. I gotta fight. I gotta, I gotta fight can't get through and as soon as I start to think maybe I'll just quit I don't know if I can do it anymore I look back and I think God done brought me through that and if I went through that I can get through this and if I went through that one and that one now you got a problem Because it's just like David told Saul. He said, Saul, Saul said, how are you going to take out this Philistine, David? David said, here's what happened, Saul. One day I was keeping my father's sheep, and a lion and a bear came, and they took a sheep out of the flock. And he said, I went and chased the lion down, and I chased the bear down, and I killed them both with my bare hands, and this giant's about to go down too. I'm telling you this morning, when I look at what God's brought me through, when I look at the things that God has done, I can say, I know that I can get through this thing and here comes two (laughs) but here's what I look at I look at this there's one there's two there's three I done beat three you two ain't no problem for me I'm going to get to where God's called me to be. Hear me this morning. Thank you. Go sit down. Hear me this morning. There is no situation that you can allow God to stop you. God is going to propel you through the situations. God, help me. Jesus. I done messed up my PowerPoint. There it is. We're always going to have an adversary who's going to try to manipulate situations give us an opportunity for excuse but I am using my victories of yesterday to strengthen me for my fight today because of that situation I'm stronger I am wiser I am better some of y'all been through some stuff it wasn't fun going through it but you're better because of it you're stronger because of it You're wiser because of it. Somebody say, excuse me. Last excuse, and don't worry, I'm not closing. For people not growing, building, and being is Satan. 
It's not self. It's not situation. It's Satan. I have news this morning. Satan has one goal, and that is to steal, kill, and destroy. His goal is to take you to a place called hell where he's going to spend eternity. He wants you to spend it with him. That's not a good partner to hang out with. And we use the devil as an excuse. The devil made me do it. That's not true. I've heard people say, if the devil quits attacking me, then I'll grow. If, if the devil quits doing this, I'll build it. If the devil quits doing this, I promise I'll get committed. You will never get committed. You'll never get connected. You say, well, how can you say that? Because the only time the devil's going to quit attacking you is if you're dead or he's got you. And you're no longer a threat to his kingdom. We need to understand the enemy's always going to be the opposite of us becoming what God's called us to be. He's always going to be the opposite of what God has called us to be. The enemy will provide excuses as to why God can't, why God won't, why God's unable. He'll provide dabbles of doubt so that we can start to have those seeds planted in our mind. But the word identifies him. How many believes the word? I believe the word. The word identifies him as a liar and the father of all lies. There is no truth in him. I'm not interested in taking victory lessons from someone that's lost every fight. I was going to say something about the Reds, but I'm not going to because some of you like them. I'm not going to go get vocal lessons from someone that can't carry a tune in a bucket. But hold on. But we're listening to that voice that is stopping us from being what God's called us to be as if it's truth. But this morning, I want to listen to a voice of an undefeated champion, undisputed, undefeated champion and victor. He hails from heaven, and he's the king of kings, and he's the Lord of lords. When Jesus cried on the cross, it is finished. I'm thankful that the sacrifice was complete. But not only was the sacrifice complete, I have victory over the enemy through Jesus in my life. Done told you, Jesus is not coming back after a dead, weak, excused filled church. But Jesus is coming back for a victorious bride. Help me, Jesus. Listen to me. I know there are times when weddings and mess-ups happen, but very rarely is there situations where the bride presents herself with her makeup all messed up, with her dress all torn and ratty. No, they will do everything they can to primp and process and get that bride as beautiful so she can see the groom. Can I tell you, God is looking to, Jesus is coming back after a bride that is beautiful, that is spotless, that is pure, that is victorious. Help me, Jesus. Hallelujah. But this morning's message isn't why not. This morning's message is titled what? You're excused. Here we go. (laughs) Some of you got it. If anybody's flown before in an airplane... When they, when they land, they come over the intercom and the, the, steward, the, the flight attendant says, uh, please cross-check doors for arrival. And they say cross-check complete, which I don't even know if they check them, but I'm hoping they do. <laughs> I'm just kidding, they have to. Cross-check complete. And then they say, you're free to exit. Sometimes they'll say, have a nice day. Other days they'll just go, (laughs) bye-bye. This morning, 
there's some spiritual doors that have been cross-checked for arrival. And you are free to excuse yourself from excuses. I'm saying excuse me to excuses. Here's why. Kenny, come here. I done threw you once. I'm glad you're sitting on the front row, man. You're just a great prop to use. Thank you so much. We should make a Kenny bobblehead Sunday. Amen. Okay, so <laughs> church attendants go crazy. But when we're trying to get out of a situation, we're trying to move, we'll say, oh, oh, sorry, excuse me. Somebody's blocking the door. You know how people walk out of the door of a restaurant or a, or a supermarket or whatever, and they, they just, they're like five of them, and they all walk out the door thinking they're doing a blessing to get rid of the table, and they stop right in front of the door everybody exits out of? If you're that person, don't be that person. Okay, so, but what do you do? You, you go, oh, so, excuse me, because I am exiting. I am getting around. I am moving. And there's some of you this morning that need to say excuse me to excuses. I, I know, I know, I, I, I know this morning you say, well, pastor, there's a reason it's not an excuse. If you fell into one of the three categories this morning, I'm telling you it is an excuse. And it's time to move from excuses to expectation. I am breaking free from excuses, and I am breaking into what God has that is greater for me. I, I'm going, I'm hurrying. Somebody say, excuse me. Now, I've seen some of you say it this way. Maybe not uh, directly, but I'm pretty sure somewhat directly. You'll say, excuse me, excuse me, and they don't move. And you go, <clears throat> excuse me, and you do this next thing. <clears throat> Chelsea's turning red back there. I don't know what's going on. So, excuse me. Get a little more vocal about it. Get a little bit more impactful about it. You say, well, well what does that have to do with anything? Listen, if you think the enemy of your soul is just going to get out of your way because you say, excuse me, he's not. You're going to have to get a little bit direct about it and say, excuse me, it's time to move. I am evicting excuses out of my life, and I am bringing expectation in the door. Come on, Dylan, come on. He thought I was going to use him as a, as, a, as a prop this morning, but I didn't. I just wanted to play the piano. Here's the thing. I've seen people, literally seen people. A plane lands. <laughs> lands. Cross-check door for arrival. Doors are cross-checked. You can leave. Everybody's getting up, standing up, pulling their suitcases out, all kinds of stuff. Noisy. And every once in a while, you'll see one or two people, usually just one, not very often, but you see them every once in a while. Dude sitting up against the window like this, got headphones on. Everybody going past him. Slept through cross-check. Slept through arrival. Slept through the plane being deplaned. And the flight attendant has to come up and go, excuse me, are you dead? <laughs> hey, good sign if they're snoring, they ain't dead. All right. Excuse, excuse me. Excuse me. And they, they wake up and they're like, oh, to take stuff off their phone or off their headset. Take their earphones out. Put their stuff up. Get off the plane. 
this morning. Some of y'all been sleeping in excuses. And I've come to nudge you a little bit. Say, excuse me. Excuse me. It's time to wake up. So you can say, excuse me from the excuses. This morning, you don't have to leave excuses. You don't have to walk out of here and say, excuse me from excuses. You can keep using them. He'll provide them for you till the day you die. And I'm not telling you, you won't make it to heaven, but you will not fulfill what God's called you to fulfill on this earth with excuses in your life. You can stay in that place of excuses. You can stay with the little God. You can stay with the God that can't do anything. You can stay there. But if you're going to hang out with me, we're going to hang out with a God that says, why not? If you're going to hang out with me, we're excusing ourselves from excuses and saying God is about to do more than we can even imagine. He's about to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. stand all over the house this morning. I know we're about to have lunch. Some of us, if you wanted to stay, that's great. And I honestly can tell you I care less about that dinner right now. Because I believe that you have heard the thing that is blocking you, it's an excuse. And right now, the enemy's trying to get you, a, well, what's for lunch? Well, what are we doing next? When's he going to stop? It is a distraction. It is an excuse to keep you from being what God's called you to be. Can I tell you, the devil don't care if you go to church. He attends every week. He doesn't care. But he does care when you start saying, excuse me from excuses. He does care when you start getting dogmatic and say, I'm going to fight. I'm going to keep fighting. This morning, if you're in this house, and you believe that God is a why not God. He's a, he's a why not. And you say, I'm ready to excuse myself from some excuses. Not some. I said that wrong. I'm going to excuse myself from all excuses. I, I, listen, I don't want to just be kind of free. I want to be totally free. This morning, if you're in this house, and you say, I'm ready. I'm ready. If that's you, here's all we're going to ask you to do. I'm not going to give you an altar call. The altars are open. But if you're in this house and you say, I'm ready to excuse myself from excuses, I want to see your hand in this place today. Thank you, Jesus. Excuse myself from some excuses. Hallelujah. Come on.